important uh, platform for this important conversation. It's uh, one we at NBC Nightly News have been covering very aggressively. And there's a lot of engagement, and there's a lot of names now attached to it. And we're going to hear from a couple of those names. Let me introduce our panelists. Remy Ma is a rapper who has received Grammy nominations. She's received Grammy nominations for Best Rap Song and Best Rap Performance for All the Way Up. Welcome. Welcome. Good, good. Remy was released from prison in 2014 after serving more than six years. Now she's dedicated her time to also being a prison reform advocate, especially for the women inmate population. So we're looking forward to chatting with her about that. Meek Mill. Meek Mill is a rapper. What's going on? All right. Meek is a rapper whose 2012 album, Dreams and Nightmares, made history when it debuted and peaked at number two on the Billboard 200 chart. He was recently released from prison after being sentenced for violating his probation. His case made national headlines after garnering overwhelming support. Meek Mill is using his platform to educate the public about prison reform. I welcome both of you. Looking forward to it. And thank you for your thank adding you. your voices to this conversation. I mean, the, the two of you come from different portions of this conversation. Uh, Meek, let me start with you and the probation system. G correct me if I'm wrong. You spent more time in jail on your probation violation than you did your actual conviction. Uh, yeah, I started off with uh, 10 years of probation. 10 years ended up stretching out to be 16 years of probation from a case that I caught uh, when I was 18 years old. Um, 31 years old right now, and uh, I think seven months ago, I had to serve a two to four year sentence in state prison from something that happened when I was 18 years old, which been following me my whole adult life. I spent my whole adult life on probation. A lot of people say the, the, the probation system is almost designed to keep you in the system, to keep you rotating you back into the system. Uh, of course, I believe it's uh, made to keep you in the system. Uh, 18 years old, I was raised in Philadelphia. Uh, shout out to Philly in the building. And uh, you know, Philadelphia, it's a beautiful city. You got beautiful people, but uh, you also have bad environments where it's, it's plagued with drugs and, and violence. And I grew up in one of them neighborhoods where actually you get a lot of police contact as a, a, a young black male and I end up catching a case at 18 years old. And at 22 years old, I ended up striking uh, a rap deal. And I started doing good for myself ever since tw 18 years old. I've never been back to prison for a crime ever in my life. But at the age of 31, I'm being sent to prison for two to a four year sentence for popping a woolly, all because of probation. Like a lot of people don't understand probation. At some points where you don't even have to commit a crime to go back to prison, like uh, you can smoke. You could come see your probation officer late and go to jail for five years, or you could change your address of place where you stay and go to jail for two to three years without even committing crime. When you might have a job, you might employ people, you might be an employee yourself, you might be a father, you might be a mother, you might take care of your family, and you know, uh, these conditions are the average person would go back to jail nine times out of 10 if they had to be on these type of restrictions for years. Let me bring uh, Remy into the conversation. You were able to go back to your music almost immediately, but a lot of young women who are in similar circumstances to you, they come on the outside. What do they face? What do you want people to understand about that, that post-incarceration period? Well, the post-incarceration period for a lot of people, especially the way the laws are designed in New York, it's you're still in the system. Like right now, I've been home August to make four years since I've been out of prison, but I'm still on post-release supervision until next year. They give, it, they're starting to attach it to your sentence now, just in case you fortunate enough like myself or me to be able to have a support system where you come home and you have a job and you don't have to you know, get caught up in the recidivism situation that they, they have these systems set up for. So what they do is, okay, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it to you when you get sentenced. Here's eight years for your actual crime, and then I'm going to add five years of post-release on top of that. Post-release, which is a little bit worse than parole, because parole can only extend as far as your original sentence. Post-release, like Meek said, you could, I, I have to be in the house at 11 o'clock. Like, I have to ask for permission to come to places like this. I could have a contract for hundreds of thousands, and if my parole officer decides that she's in the mood that day and she don't want to let me go, I can't go. You know, so it's, 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 it starts to mess with your life. So you end up being on the hook longer than if yeah, you had just been yes. paroled. If you would have just, if you would have just did, you never really finished paying your debt to society. You can't vote. You can't move into certain buildings. Just recently, I was trying to move because I, I just wanted to move to a different um, area. And they ask you these questions, the same questions they ask any, you know, person that's not a celebrity. Do you have a criminal history? Have you ever been convicted of a felony? And I could not move into the building. And it was only for a lease. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna live here for a year. I offered to pay the whole year off. It was like 6,000 a month. I paid a whole year. Um, I'll give you my credit score, seven, seven, whatever it was. I think it was like 701, something crazy. And they was like, no, because you were convicted of a crime in 2007. So you never really finish paying your debt to society. And for the average person who doesn't have an entourage or a team or a record deal or situations where they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars, they come home and they can't get a job anywhere because as soon as they find out that you were convicted of a felony, regardless of what crime it was, you can't work there. As soon as they find out that you, know, you live in a halfway house or whatever the situation is, you just never finish paying your debt to society. And we need to do something about this because there are people who change their life, especially with violent crimes. Most of the people with violent crimes, they never commit those crimes again. It was an act, a one instant act of whatever rage or whatever happened. But they trap people like that and they trap people who have drug addictions, people who um, have scams, like the um, credit card scams and things like that, because they know nine times out of 10, once you get caught for that, you're not gonna be able to get a job nowhere else. So what do you do? You go back to what you know. You get caught again, and now we have all this time over here, and from when you 18, you catch something, you end up being 30 something still for the same crime. And the environment that we live in, that's all we know. That's all, that's all you're set up to do. You, we don't have these great outlets where we can escape it. Do, uh, Meek, do you, do you believe, is there any form of rehabilitation in the system as, as you've come to know it? And is there a chance for a young man or a young woman to really put it behind them? Uh, yeah, I think it's a form of re rehabilitation. I just don't think this is the way you do it. A lot of people say uh, the system uh, need to be fixed. I'm, I think we need to break the system and rearrange it and do it all over again because uh, where we come from, and like my situation, a lot of people always said, like Remy said, they always said, well, he's a celebrity, he's a rapper. No, actually, I came from the inside, and that's why I made sure. Today, I got a show. That's, made, that's why I made sure I stopped here today to talk about justice reform because I was there with people who don't have the resources like me, like young brothers that was in college, and they got locked up for crimes they didn't commit, and they, had to, they was facing so much time, they had to take a deal just so they wouldn't get 20 years in prison and took three years, now they got felonies on their record and they can't go back to college, they can't get a nice job just because they grew up in a bad environment and they got accused of a crime they didn't do. So, you know, I just think that we need to break the system and rearrange it. I don't know who made these rules up. I know uh, hundreds of years ago we come from slavery where the rules were not for humans. Uh, I don't think this is too far away under the 13th Amendment and say when you under state custody, uh, you're allowed to be treated as a slave. Everything about it is wrong. Uh, you know, I'm not saying nobody deserves to go to jail, but I'm just saying like when people are trying to get back and change their life and get back on the same path, because me, I was, I've been trying to be a rapper and make a lot of money and feed my family. My goal has been to take my mother out the hood, my sister out the hood, my nephew, my niece, my son, and it's something that I did. Along the way, I got locked up for Willie and the Bike, uh, being arrest, uh, I got arrested for being addicted to Percocets. I didn't commit a crime, and you know, they took me out of my, they took me away from my family, put me somewhere in the mountains with a bunch of racist white people, and you know, locked me in a cell where I couldn't do for my family without me committing crime. I employ people. I do, I do a lot of charity. Uh, I actually, I got a lot of younger brothers that come up behind me that I take care of and look out for. Even a lot of young rappers in my city 
that I do favors for and things for to see them grow and be able to take care of their family. They snatched me away from all that so quick without me committing crime. I couldn't sit down in my cell and realize, like, I couldn't cope with this being right. And I couldn't come up with anything that this was right. And I know it's a lot of people that come from the same place where I come from that don't got help and that's trapped and doomed. And I seen it with my own two eyes. I believe Remy seen it too. She actually, she did eight years. I did six months this last time. And you know, this six months to me, it was like one of the worst experiences I went through in my life because I know what path I was on and I was being placed in prison where I don't belong. And you know, it was just wasting my talent, wasting my life and wasting everything and that, everything. And I want to ask Remy, what was it in your experience in prison that made you want to come out and be an advocate for change? Well, for one, and I think this was a major problem in Meek's case too, and what, what we as people, uh, we, we tend to just listen to whatever the media tells us. And the media, they do things for people to click on their blogs, or they do things for people to buy newspapers and for people to tune in to tonight at the news. If you ever watch the, the, the clips leading up to the news, they tell you the most horrific line that'll make you want to watch it. Clickbait, that's yeah. what they call it. So, you know, and there's this thing called freedom of speech. So they don't really have to have any evidence or anything to say some of the things that they say. And a lot of times you are judged before you even make it to a courtroom. And then we have this, this notion that, you know, um, anybody who's in jail or went to jail has to be guilty. Everybody that's in jail or went to jail isn't guilty. The same way everybody that's walking around in these streets ain't innocent. And what, what, what happens is sometimes you get forced into situations where they tell you, okay, we cannot take this to trial. Take three years, take five years, and we'll make it all go away. But if you go to trial, you could get 15 to 25 years, and you thinking, I got a son that's seven years old, or I got a mom that's a little elderly and I take care of her. If, if things go bad, and most of the time, I don't know anybody who's ever beat trial in my life, and I know so many people that have went to trial. So you, you end up taking these deals because you got caught up in a situation. And when we come from these environments, people are like, well, you shouldn't have got in that situation. I got out of the hood, but my whole family wasn't out of the hood. People that I grew up with wasn't out of the hood. You could just drive down the wrong block in a nice car and people gonna pull you over. Or they gonna try to antagonize you to act a certain way or do same way, or oh, resisting the rest or whatever, just to take you through the system. Just that enough alone could cause you to be a violation. If I get pulled over, they told me, if I'm in the car with my husband and he get pulled over, I had police contact, I'm just in the car. So they set up these rules that make it crazy. And it, it made me sit, when I was sitting in jail, I was looking at some of the things like, okay, so I'm not gonna be able to vote. Why are you taking away my right to vote? Cause, you can't, Cause I kinda have an idea what's going on now. I would wanna vote. I never even took voting seriously before I went to prison. When I came home, I went, like I, I can vote for certain things now because I signed papers and wrote to this person and got that letter back and wrote just for permission to vote again. What does me ever committing a crime have to do with voting for the people that's in charge of my life? If I shouldn't be able to vote, I shouldn't have to pay taxes neither. Let me try to not do that, you know? And I realized that some of the people that I was with, it's, it's so crazy because the people I grew up with, I still say they're my friends because I've been calling my friends for so long, but my real friends are people that I actually was incarcerated with. And they force you while you in there, because I, I was like, when I get here, I'm not talking to nobody, I'm just gonna stay in myself. They force you to interact with people. But then when you get out, it's a crime and a violation to talk to anybody that's been in jail or that's also on parole or anything like that. But these are the people that I know was down for me when I wasn't Remy Ma the rapper or anything. I was just an inmate 08 G0485 like everybody else. And I realized that when they came home, they, some of my friends been home four years, still in a halfway house, still can't get a job, still haven't seen their kids in 10 years because their kids got ripped away from them and put in some system and they lost their parental rights. And I realized that all the programs that were set up was set up mostly for men because men have a higher incarceration rate. However, what about the females that, you know, come home? And when I came home, I was walking around for almost a year. I didn't have a driver's license. I didn't have health insurance. I didn't have... I didn't have anything, anything that you're supposed to have as a human being w walking from point A to point B, I didn't have, but I had to put all of that on hold. I was walking around with a prison ID because I had to focus on 
getting money to support myself. I, what was I, what was I going to do with a felony and seven years of no history of credit or anything? So that's what made me want to start my, my foundation for, to help women who's released from prison. We're, we're, almost, we're almost out of time, and this is more than a half-hour conversation, but I do want to wrap up by, by throwing the question out to you both. I'll start with you, Meek. Is there something unique about this time right now? Do you feel like the public is paying attention, that our politicians are paying attention, that this may be the moment that some of this is going to change? Yeah, I believe this is the perfect season right now. Anytime you got uh, the White House uh, talking about justice reform, uh, they know this is a, this a topic that uh, the people are paying attention to because I know a lot of people in this is rum laws, family members to the system. Uh, people who have family members on probation who's in and out of jail for not even committing crimes. Uh, I just think this... This is like you got the Me Too movement going on. You have justice reform going on. These are the most talked about situations uh, in society right now. And I think right now is the season. Uh, a lot of people, when I was locked up going through my, my situation, I always read like articles and people used to say like, he's not the face of justice reform. I don't want to be the face. I never wanted anybody to feel any pity for me, feel sorry for me because this was has always been my life. This always been my trials and tribulations before I was famous, I was on probation and I was being treated wrong from the system. So, you know, I always was in this alone, but I felt if God gave me the platform to be the face of this and shine the light on me where I could speak on other brothers that's in my situation, uh, I would be the one to do it. I feel like I fit the situation perfectly. Uh, I've been in and out the system my whole life since the age of 18 from one crime. Uh, I actually represent people that come from bad environments, and my brand, if you don't know me, my brand is called Dream Chases, and a lot of young kids that come from the ghettos of America, they look at me a certain way because I inspire them to make it out the ghetto. That has always been my drive and my message that I gave to younger kids first. Uh, and I feel like I'm the perfect one that could carry it on my back. A lot of people, you know, uh, with social media, I see like I always see people going through their trials and tribulations. I've been through some things to get here. Even to be on this stage, I just was locked up in a cell 23 hours a day, shackled up, ankles to wrists. Just to get my freedom back, uh, I still had to come home, be on top of my music business, my game, and stay alive in this rap industry. I had to stay on top of my family, take care of my son, my mom and them, uh, make sure I could provide and pay these bills. And this is just another job I got to take on to help people like myself and people like some of the family members of people in this crowd just to make the world a better place. You know what I mean? God gave me this position. I've been through what I've been through, and I'm going to make the most out of it. Okay. And, and, and Remy, I'll let you your close uh, with just your thoughts. Do you think the time is here that, that, that we are now focused intently on this issue? Um. I think is the time is way overdue. It, it, it should have been done a long time ago. What, what, what happens now is, and, and, I, and I hate it because I talk so much so bad about it, but like I'm so sick of camera phones and people in your face with a camera, but that's what I think in open people's eyes. All of these young black men and black women being killed and being abused, and, and you, you get to see it now. It's been going on for years. It's just it wasn't out in the public eye. So now that everybody has a camera, that's why they try to stop it. They're trying to make it a crime for you to film police officers while they working. No, we should, we should know what's going on out here. And people are seeing, why did that boy get killed? I just, he wasn't even doing nothing. He reached to go get his license. Or, you know, how did she, she go from being in her cell and now she's dead? Like, did, we need answers now. So with the social media era and everyone having a camera phone and everybody being, everybody in here who has a phone is a, is a walking journalist. Everybody who has a social media page, they have a platform where they could talk. They can't just shut us up like they used to. It's been going on forever. I remember being a kid, you know, seeing my dad get thrown on the ground by police and we was just going into our building. What are you doing here? What's, what's going on? He ain't have his ID on him. That was a crime in my neighborhood. You walk, you in front of your building, you don't have ID on you. I doing you, that was enough grounds for them to throw you on the ground, and then they say you resisting arrest. Who wouldn't resist arrest if you were in front of your home and somebody's throwing you on the ground in front of your children? So these were things that, these were ploys that they were using to, to open the door, and once you do that, now I have a resisting arrest. Now, oh, uh, the 
I broke a nail, so you, you injured a police officer. So it was things like this, and it follows you throughout your life. And we grew up, I, grew, I, remember, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up with an animosity for police authority. It, it, it times I had been in the industry for years. I've been doing it since I was 18 years old. And I would see police, no, I'm not committing a crime. No, I don't have any drugs on me, no weapon. And I'm nervous. Why am I nervous? It's, 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 it's to the point now where I shouldn't have to walk around nervous when I'm not even doing anything. I shouldn't have to, my son shouldn't have to walk around and be in his car and take off his hat or take off his hood and drive a certain way so to make sure he don't get pulled over. And, and, I, and I appreciate and I applaud everybody who stay on it. And I, and I just be annoyed sometimes with us as celebrities because sometimes we'll be on it and then something else will happen and we'll jump to that fad and we'll jump to something else. You have to, we, I say it all the time, we have to stay vigilant in, in the process. We can't wait till another kid die and then everybody's marching and then they stop for a while. Then another kid die and everybody got on the rest in peace shirts. Like we gotta stay on it and change this lot so that our children don't have to grow up scared to walk around when they see somebody in a uniform. Well, Remy and, and Meek, you're both more than talented musicians. You've got an important platform. You've got an important voice. And thank you for helping us with this conversation. Before we get out of here, I want to say one thing, too. Uh, well, my situation, a lot of people don't know, too. I was arrested by black cops. I was arrested by uh, my judge was a, a black woman. And you know, I, I always want to uh, address this issue like on a big platform or like the self-hate issue within our culture where, uh, like Remy said, she talked about like social media. Uh, I caught my case before social media. I don't know if you seen my mug shot. I got stitches on both sides of my face. My face is swollen from both sides. And I only weighed about 130 pounds. I got arrested by all cops that weighed 200 pounds plus a group of cops at one time. And uh, I actually was found guilty for pointing a gun at more than two, three cops at one time. I was found guilty for actually pointing a firearm in the direction of three, four cops at one time, which everybody in this room probably would know is false. And when I got in the courtroom in front of a black judge, I felt like a sense of safety when I seen a black judge in that courtroom because when I first stepped in the courtroom, I thought she was going to ask me first before anything what happened to my face because she had a picture of my mugshot. She never asked me what happened to my face because she's so used to young black men being beat up by police officers that it was usual to her. And the fact that is thousands of young black men being killed by police officers without carrying a firearm, she found me guilty of pointing a firearm at three cops at one time without a single shot being fired, without anybody being injured, without anything happening, which we all know that's a false reality in the ghettos of America. And for the three cops that locked me up, they all were African-American. They got on the stand and cried. They pointed their finger at me. They labeled me like a menace, like I tried to take their life. I'm not suicidal. I grew up uh, in a good home, a single parent home. I know if you point a gun at a police officer, you'll be shot down on the spot. If you reach for a gun, even if you have a gun on you, you'll probably be killed. I never been stupid enough to pick up and aim a gun at a police officer. I was found guilty of that. And 10 years later, uh, I'm doing well for myself. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I got a job. I'm taking care of my family. Just as a young black man, and forget the music industry and success or anything, I'm taking care of my son, my family. I take care of my mother, my grandmother, my sister, my sister, daughter. None of them have to pay bills because I made the sacrifice to step up for my family. My dad was killed when I was young. And I still got a black lady over top of my head really aiming to take me off the streets when I haven't been involved in crime in the last 15 years of my life since a, a child. And I just want to address the, the, the subject of that. As people in our culture, I think we really got to step up. Even young black men like us killing each other day for day, is, is I think we really got to address that first within ourselves before we move on to the next thing because if we don't value ourselves, I don't believe no other race will ever value us. And I, right. think, I think people should really pay attention when you got me, and I don't know if people use the word nigga, I use, I call that house nigga, when you got somebody black on a podium actually 
giving people three, four years for being addicted to drugs. Like, it's not just me. It's, it's, it's thousands of kids that go in front of judges like these, and these are kids of her own race where she know we grew up in environments where our parents was on drugs or our, all our friends are on drugs or we was highly influenced to use drugs, and they giving us three, four years in prison, taking us out of our homes when we got kids, and locking us away for being addicted to drugs, for showing up to see a probation officer late, because that's a decision they make. You don't just, it's not a mandatory sentence. Like when you go, say if Remy seen her probation officer late and she was violated, she would go in front of a judge and they could give you 30 days in prison. They could give you a week in prison. You got a black lady sitting on a podium in a, on, on a bench in Philadelphia giving kids three years, five years for not even committing crime. And I think that we should definitely pay attention to the self-hate issue. That's all I got to say. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I appreciate being in this room. Uh, I appreciate Remy Lester. All right. Mick Mill, Remy Ma, thank you so much.